<laughs> okay, and we're live. Georgie Dinkov, how are you, sir? Hey, <laughs> thanks for inviting me again. <laughs> this is our podcast. You're my you're my uh, equal co-host, and so uh, I, I, like we were talking about, I think um, I feel strongly that like we've hit some kind of critical mass. You know, I'm getting so much more email. So many people are saying they're listening to the show, and it's uh, really heartening. And uh, to think that. Um, I don't know. It just started with like, it's just you and I chatting. And then of course, Ray, but it's been a fun ride so far. I agree completely. <laughs> I've been getting slammed by emails. I cannot <laughs> dig myself out of that, well, out of that mess. <laughs> well, I was saying somebody was like in episode 27, you said X, Y, Z. And I was like, I have no, no recollection of episode 27. I have to like so go how back. How do you know how many episodes we have? <laughs> <laughs> So anyways, thank you for uh, this wild ride. So we talked last week, and so I'll start with the same question. How are things in D.C.? What's uh, new in, in your world? Anything uh, local happening? Uh, the mayor is supposed to reopen, I mean, remove the uh, most of the restrictions by May 21st in terms of indoor gatherings, like, like capacities at restaurants and things like that. She has, she has now said that she will not honor yet the CDC recommendation that vaccinated people should not be wearing masks outdoors and indoors. Mm -hmm. And this is causing a little bit of consternation here in the city. Well, it depends on who you listen to. If you listen to the mainstream media, like, oh, the CDC is crazy. Like, we, they're removing the masks too fast. You know, we need to be more careful, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because Biden said, you know, get vaccinated <laughs> yeah, that's or what wear a for, mask right? forever, <laughs> right? It's your choice. Yeah. Um, but 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 you know CDC said okay kind of like went along with Biden and said okay if 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 you are vaccinated then no need to wear a mask definitely not outside and now they're saying like you don't you don't have to wear it inside either um, but Bowser has not basically has said like she's not going to implement that that recommendation yet but she will she's claimed that by the twenty first she will remove the, the 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 capacity the limits on on indoor meeting capacities, like indoor meetings, like churches, et cetera, et cetera, businesses, restaurants, bars, uh, you know, things like that. Um, but we'll see. I think most people, I'm seeing more and more people walking on the street without masks. And considering how liberal DC is, mm -hmm. like a month ago, like, I mean, I was still getting, I'm still getting the dirty looks anyways, because I just look like a, like a guy who is not, not particularly <laughs> friendly and doesn't like his fellow men too much or woman. <laughs> Uh, but a month ago I was getting not, not only the dirty looks, but like people were accosting me from like across the street saying like, Hey, put on your damn mask or effing mask, put on your damn mask. <laughs> now I don't get, I don't get this anymore. Not because I, I think they've like somehow decided not to mess with me, but because it, so many other people are not wearing masks now. I, since the, the, the recently, I feel like I've been emboldened to not wear a mask almost anywhere, but I only go to a few places and I've just like stopped even bringing a mask. But um, so this is funny, you know, and not that this is news to anybody that listens to this show, but that tweet that's like the the rule is now simple. Get vaccinated or wear a mask until you do. The choice is yours. The funny thing is, it's the the rule is now simple. Get endlessly vaccinated with <laughs> with boosters for the rest of your life or wear a mask right. until you do. And I think. Well, hold on a second. Like, who, who is he to set the rules? Are, isn't it up to the states? Yeah, I, you're right. So like, how can he say this? Like, this is the rule. Like, OK, so you, he may say it at the federal level, which I think he did, like for federal employees and people working in like on federal property and things like that. Well, we're under a, 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 a dictatorship now. <laughs> you know, so. well, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because it's the horizontal totalitarianism. I'm mm -hmm. getting yelled at from across the street by people who like never met me, never don't know me. They're just, you know, they're they're just, you know, trying to signal what is it called, virtue signaling, yeah, that they belong to the group, and I'm an outsider. Well, I, I've always, what is it like? One woman like told me on the because uh, we got into an argument about masks on the playground. She's like. Mr. You're the wrong guy, the wrong place at the wrong time. And I said, story of my life. That's not exactly <laughs> a unique situation right now. <laughs> what What was that in reference to? She, be, you were wrong. Oh, like, I don't, what did she even mean? About and I kept telling her, listen, first of all, here's the study that said, so, well, first it started about social distancing. Like she was, she was not wearing a mask. Um, and I was there at the playground with my children. And she arrived with her child. And then she basically like her child started playing with mine. And then basically she's like, well, stay away from my child. I'm uh -huh. like, your child is coming to my children and I'm standing next <laughs> to them. I'm not going to walk away just because your child is approaching. She's like, well, this is irresponsible. You need to keep social distancing. Where is your mask? I said, where is yours? Well, long story short, this <laughs> argument obviously is not going to progress in a, in a nice manner because if somebody is confrontational, I will not defuse the situation. 
I mean, I, I will not, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I will not escalate it, right? I'm not going to be the You will bust the out your Bulgarian jiu-jitsu and put her in a heel hook. Or something, right? <laughs> Verbally, at least. And that's, that's, that's where it, eventually she just basically like threw her, her arms in the air and said, like, uh, well, um, you know, like, I can't argue with people like you. And you specifically look like you're the wrong guy at the wrong place at the wrong that's time. Biz- that's, like, bizarre. That is really weird to decipher. Anyways, okay, so um, – but yeah, so again, that uh, any, well, any other new? Uh, so you linked me some articles about vaccine stuff. Was there anything? I know there's cultural stuff related. What did you want to chat about first? Uh, whatever, take your pick. I mean, there's like quite a few things. There's well, like posts on the blog. There's uh, oh yeah, the the uh, this this thing, the, the fact check, right? Mm-hmm. So now apparently a virologist. If you scroll down, mm-hmm. what's her name? Uh, just scroll up a little bit. Uh, no, scroll up so I can see oh, like. Sorry. Uh, Yes. Lin- uh, molecular biologist, Dr. Jan Chi Chun Lindsay, she's the one and she, she spoke at a conference. Uh, I'm sorry, meeting at the of the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Mm-hmm. So it's not like she gave a conference in front of a bunch of anti-vaxxers, right? Mm-hmm. This was this was an actual official public hearing, and she gave uh, – scroll down a little bit. It says Dr. and who, and she basically says who confirmed to AFP that she was the speaker. So she's giving her opinion in front of the CDC, especially the committee, which is responsible for basically for setting up the safety standards for, vac- for vaccination, and she said – the exact same thing as Mike uh, Yadon. Mm-hmm. Yadon? Yadon? Yadon, I think. Been, Yadon has been saying for a long time that, look, at the very least, we need to start worrying about the syncytin protein, which is a subset of the mRNA sequence for the spike protein, mm-hmm. which is what the mRNA, mRNA vaccines contain. Mm-hmm. And it, we're, we could be triggering an infertility in an entire generation. And then, of course, like this fact check goes back and says, oh, but then we spoke to a few experts and they're saying there is no evidence that these vaccines cause infertility. She didn't say they cause infertility. She said that they could be causing infertility. And right now there are no studies confirming whether they do or don't, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the whole thing about fact-checking this is crap because she didn't state any facts. Mm-hmm. She just said <laughs> we need to worry about this and we need to actually test it. And they're saying, well, there's no evidence. Yeah, but what is it? What, what was the expression? The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, 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 but I can immediately come back and say, well, there's no evidence to the contrary either. There's no evidence that they don't cause infertility, right? And all she was saying was that, look, the syncytin protein is there. We've seen with other interventions in the past that have contained proteins significantly similar to the syncytin protein. We've seen infertility issues in animal studies, right? Mm-hmm. And I immediately thought, you don't need to worry about animal studies. What about that study with the Ken- uh, the Kenyan vaccine, mm-hmm, where they actually the Catholic the Catholic bishops yeah. caught mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> caught the the vaccination people administering vaccines that are known to contain HCG, which is n- absolutely no business whatsoever in that specific vaccine against mm-hmm. tetanus, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so so it's already known that this is going on in other countries, um, you know, under the this guy uh, some different guys like oh we need to vaccinate the. Uh, the, the poor dying people in Kenya, otherwise they'll all die from tetanus. Um, <laughs> and and now she's saying like, she didn't say that, but she didn't, she didn't reference the Kenyan fiasco, but she said, we need to worry about this because it's known, we know from animal studies that it can happen, right? Um, and then the, immediately you, you get the fact checks, the fact checkers saying, no, there's no evidence for that, right? Well, nobody claimed anything here. And the whole title, Sci- a scientist makes an incorrect claim about vaccines. <laughs> It's, it's nonsense <laughs> because she did not make any claims. All she said was it could be causing infertility because of the similarity of the uh, between the mRNA for the spike protein and the syncytin protein. So let's study it and check whether it does or it doesn't. Immediately, this is interpreted as, as a claim. And, of course, the fact checkers are saying all over it, saying, like, no, it's not true. So if you scroll down, you'll see the immediate, the first debunking, quote, unquote, was, uh, it, seems, it says, Lindsay claims it's credible. Can you scroll up? Yeah. There is credible reason credible reason to believe that will cross-react, et cetera, et cetera. That's not the same thing as saying that they do. Mm-hmm. She's saying we have significant, call it re- reasonable suspicion, right? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, so you can start an investigation. She didn't say that they that they do, um, and then immediately the, the debunking was, well, there is no evidence that they do. Well, she didn't say there is. She said, let's check it. So, but she's a she's the highest um, uh, uh, place scientist so far that I've seen uh, speaking at such an official conference, mm-hmm. not a, not conference, but at such an official meeting. Neither Mike Yadon nor any of the others who had voiced concerns, uh, nor nor Judy Mikovits, none of these people were ever allowed. They would ever probably never be allowed to set a 
foot in the CDC, uh, let alone speak in front of the Committee on Safety of Immunization Practices, right? But if she's there, this means she's part of the, she, she, she is the mainstream, right? And if she's worried about it, then to me that's, I don't know, it spells trouble. I guess we're going to find out very recently, uh, very soon. But the more troubling thing is that, as I send you the other link, which said the World Health Organization is now saying the second wave of COVID would be much deadlier than the first one. <laughs> and why exactly is that? Because then yet another study, which I send you by email, said the human immune system, just a new study confirmed that rapidly evolves um, in order, uh, rapidly evolves and is capable of recognizing new variants. And in fact, they're expected to be less deadly because you have already built up immunity if you got exposed to the to the original, right? Mm -hmm. If you got if you got exposed to COVID nineteen, um, whatever mutation happens to COVID nineteen, usually it actually only covers up to five percent of the of the protein sequence. And and um, it's been shown that even people who had the SARS CoV one, which is uh, uh, I think that it was first discovered in like two thousand ten or two thousand nine, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they were already almost fully immune to the SARS CoV two, which is causing the COVID nineteen. And and those two viruses are actually only about seventy percent similar. And then if the mutations between the current COVID-19 and the new mutations of the same virus are only 5% different, then you, should, you shouldn't be worrying about this at all. And if there, if there is an increase in death counts um, you know, uh, uh, during the second wave, then we need to start digging and figuring out like what exactly is going on because it's probably not the virus causing it. Well, that's what boosters are for, for these variants, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> to take right. care of And them. then the booster for the booster. And it never <laughs> ends. It's going to end up, like, it, 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 we'll get to the point where one hour of each one of your days will be dedicated <laughs> to getting vaccinated or getting some kind of infusions, remotely, of course, remotely controlled through your personal infusion robot at home, freely provided by Pfizer, or, or they'll probably merge and form, like, one mega global pharma corporation fused with the government in, in, in some gory monstrosity. And they'll send you a free robot that will that you will have to be hooked up to twenty four seven, or otherwise you will you will lose your health insurance. Yeah, there was a recent Ice Age Farmer video where uh, towards the end he kind of summed up like, well, not that we haven't talked about this before, but if if any if if we were just dealing with a vaccine like um, push or something, that would be one thing. But there's so many. Uh, there's so many like agendas happening at one time and, and there's no way to get situated within all of them, you know, from the food shortages, uh, the, the supply chain breakdowns, the gas shortages, right? Gas uh, shortages, the money uh, situation, the inflation and the race stuff. Um, what else? There, I, I think the race stuff. Will, 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 I'm starting to see, like, uh, 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 I'm starting to see the race, the race narrative abate a little bit, at least in DC. Oh. And I think now people are starting to get a lot more worried about inflation and like, and, and food shortages and gas shortages. Because let's face it, if you can't drive your car, if you can't hit your home, and you have nothing to eat, race probably takes a distant second place to these problems. And now people are, are legitimately scared about those, at least in DC. And there's less. Um, I, I, we haven't had a peaceful protests in uh, almost two months now. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think you're right that it's died down, but it's just like a, f a switch. They'll keep flipping on and off and t whenever they need it, you know? And so... Yeah, but people become fatigued, you know, like it's like you got to be as, as they even even during the COVID, the height of the pandemic, they kept saying people are not going to comply with any more restrictions because the, 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 the pandemic fatigue is set in. Mm -hmm. At some point, if there if the measures are basically causing too much consternation and people are seeing that this is, you know, the deadliness and whatnot, at least around them because they trust their immediate surroundings a lot more than what's coming on TV. They, they get scared by by TV, but if the TV is saying you, is telling you the, the sky is falling, the world is ending, yet nothing around you like this is happening, chances are that you'll probably give it like a few months of cautiousness, mm -hmm. but after that, you'll probably just, just get on with your life. And I think that's what's that's what happened with the riots and everything else as well. Mm -hmm. So they, they, if they bring it back, it has to be in some kind of a new reincarnation. Maybe they'll they'll do a clash between the domestic white terrorists and and like an Antifa crowd, and then that you know they will use this to like invoke martial law, something like that. I just don't think the protests as the kind of the kinds that we saw during 2020 because mm -hmm. of George Floyd death and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and other people that were shot by police. I I don't think this. This will um, uh, this this they will be able to exploit this much longer because it's kind of already it has kind of already run its course. Mm. Like a, the, a few states that considered reforming the police, there was an article in like um, I think it was in Slate.com which said 
out of the 20 states that promise that they will address the concerns of the crowds so that they stop looting, rioting, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, only one state ended qualified immunity. All the others did absolutely nothing except keep keep talking about progress and reforms until the crowd goes away. And basically now, now the other 19 states um, out of the 50, so the other 30 said they're not going to do anything to, at all. But of the 20, they said some, they will do something. Only one actually did. I think, um, was it Vermont? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm blanking, but like only one state actually did something tangible. All the others went back to doing business as usual. And the crowd now seems to not care. Um, so maybe what they'll do is kill a few innocent black people again and mm-hmm. then say like they're going to start it all over. That would work. I think that somebody on Twitter was like that whole agenda to defund the police and to get rid of local police is, is clearly to put in it's some federal police. Yeah, 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 yeah. So more control controllable federal type of police because because there are like there are some local police forces that are resisting saying we're, we're not going to do these orders. Yeah, and uh, this actually kind of happened in Portland, and I think to this day is ongoing. A lot of the local police are actually deputized mm-hmm. as DHS. Department of Homeland Security agents as well. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're kind of keeping their local role, but they're also deputized as federal police as well. Um, and then um, I think they're, uh, I think this is like a trial project, a, a trial period of seeing how, whether like how, how um, amenable the local law enforcement would be to becoming like to be moonlighting <laughs> as a second job to be a federal agent as well. Um, and if that happens, I think the federal government will pay more. And eventually probably just try to convince them and say, hey, look, we don't need this whole state thing anymore. It's leading to division and white supremacism and whatnot. Everything needs to be controlled at the federal level. So why don't you come and work for us? You know, ditch your local PD, right? And most local police departments cannot compete on salaries and benefits and pensions and things like that uh, with the federal government. I mean, they're, they're probably going to get a salary that, that, that's two, three times higher if they work for the feds. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if you can't hear this, I won't play it. You, Tiny homes. You can't hear that, right? I cannot. Okay. Everybody should watch this video. It's very good. Um, so brace for impact by Ice Age Farmer. Okay. Uh, so cyber attack. Well, we'll get into health stuff after this, guys. I promise. I always do timestamps, and so people can jump around. And uh, but I did want to talk about this since you brought it up. So cybersecurity tycoon uh, Kaspersky claims CIA hackers could. Uh, could actually be behind U.S. colonial pipeline attack blamed on Russia group, Russian group. Right. So, so take it with a grain of salt because Kaspersky is a Russian company and it's, it is associated, it's affiliated with the with the Russian government, or at least that's what the that's what the official intel sources of the United States claim. So, but it is a Russian company. So, anyways, you don't have to take everything that they say as the as God's given truth. However, this falls right along the. Uh, right within the agenda that Whitney Webb kind of outlined about a year ago about the cyber attacks and everything else, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it also combines the cyber attacks with the supply chain disruption. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think she said the two will merge. She was kind of saying they'll be, we'll see one or more of, of the following. Then she also said attacks on the financial system, right? Um, so I, I think that what we that we'll probably see next will be some kind of a an attack, a cyber attack on the financial system, which would justify the feds nationalizing the big banks, like at least the, the top five ones, which control, I don't know, 90 percent of the deposits in the United States and loans and whatnot. And and then that, that then after that, they will probably try to put an end to the cash system and try to replace it fully with a digital dollar. Yeah, that was uh, well summarized yeah the i mean i know we've talked about it many times but klaus specifically said the cyber attack was going to be worse than covid and it was going to bring down infrastructure like banks uh and other things so that is very uh scary so you will not be hearing this show when that happens <laughs> it's i think it's one s the Klaus is with uh, one s i i thought i posted something about it. maybe it was only on telegram yeah this is not about that Okay, cool. Okay, so let's uh, get rid of that. And we already talked about this, and, and we already chatted about this, right? Yes, and also the uh, the evo- the evolve the evolution of the immune system that can easily recognize. So everything that she's saying, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, everything that who is saying about the second wave being being deadlier clashes directly with the latest study, which was also referenced in, in the Scientific American, which I sent you by email if you want to bring it up, which basically said that the immune system, which is no, we've known for a long time, and I, like I said, people who had the SARS-CoV-1 virus mm-hmm. basically are were almost fully immune to the SARS-CoV-2. But this now this, this study, actually, an actual study goes farther. It says 
uh, actually, if you've had the COVID-19, or you have the SARS-CoV-2, no matter what variants of that virus, not a new vi- virus, but the variants, the mutations, whatever you want to call them, come along your come along your way, um, uh, basically you will be most likely immune to them as well. Um, and it makes sense. And and, and I think like the, the they're making now the same claims about the vaccines as well, because if it turns out that you're going to need a new vaccine for every for every new uh, mutation that's out there, yeah, it will be a great marketing move for the pharma companies. But I think even the most diehard vac- pro vaccine people will probably not be willing to go along with that plan. I mean, that means um, the, a mutation typically in the wild happens in a matter of months. So if that means <laughs> going to the doctor every month. Uh, I was only half joking when I said at some point we'll be dedicating an hour of our, of, our, of our day to mandatory medical procedures or we'll lose our insurance or the electricity will be cut off or or like the uh, like the, the windows and the doors will be boarded up because <laughs> oh, yeah. you're a threat like China, yeah. to our neighbors. <laughs> yeah, like China, exactly. Did you see that video where I think it was like a vaccine uh, clinic in a baseball court or something and a Mexican woman was talking and then the person behind her just like slumps down in their chair and falls over. No, it's oh, like, like of being being sick or what? Well, it's like people that had just got their vaccine and then they're being interviewed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the <laughs> one is talking. I I don't so even just, so just croaked. I, I don't know if they died per se, but like they, oh, uh, it's like a young girl and she just like kind of slumps over and falls down. It's um that's, pretty that's funny. Cool. I mean. Uh, it, these vaccines don't cause fainting. I think they, if something like this happens, it's probably a blood clot somewhere, and that's usually not a pleasant thing. Yeah, speaking of, so I preface this with, with like, the technology is so new, and I don't think there's any really uh, way to mitigate the effects of this vaccine. It will take a long time to f- figure out exactly what's going on. But do you think just uh, given how much we don't know that doing things like aspirin or vitamin D or vitamin K, since they oppose that rat that renin angiotensin aldosterone system activation those might help to some extent if somebody a good willed person had gotten a vaccine and they don't know what to do i think also uh some of the catatoxic steroids may help Mm -hmm. because that was the original purpose remember to to stimulate the excretion of toxic substances that are in the body Mm -hmm. so pregnenolone progesterone dhea testosterone dihydrotestosterone uh, what was that one? Um, spironolactone, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. which uh, Celia mm-hmm. really liked. Mm-hmm. Um, all of these are catatoxic steroids. So if you're taking, I guess, higher dosages of those, don't abuse, of course, the DHA and testosterone because they'll aromatize. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But the safer ones like pregnenolone and progesterone, you may be able to actually uh, get rid of a lot of the mRNA particles, even though they're encapsulated in these, um, you know, lipid nano lipid nanoparticles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, if you stimulate the, the excretion system, the detox systems, especially the phase two detoxification enzyme system in the liver, um, you will probably be able to get rid of a significant portion of that. I don't know if it will provide complete protection, but some of the older studies and the ones that Celia did, he was injecting um, these the animals, the mice and the rats that he was doing studies with, with this, something called the pertussis toxin, mm-hmm. and it was nano encapsulated in lipids as well. And basically, a significant percentage of the animals that got the steroids survived, which tells me that something happened, and then either the steroid somehow protected from the from the pertussin toxin or stimulated its excretion, um, and that's what allowed the animals to survive. So I don't. Uh, I mean, I think it would be a, a good bet. Like it would be an educated shot. Wouldn't be a shot in the dark. To, to try taking some of those catatoxic steroids together with aspirin. Niacinamide is actually something that increases the amount, the expression of cytochrome P450 in mm-hmm. the liver, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, which is the, the max, the, the master detoxification enzyme family. Um, and uh, animal studies show that taking between the human equivalent of 750 to about uh, milligrams to about a gram a day uh, almost quadrupled the expression of P4 of cytochrome P450. So all of these things that we already know are helpful for many other conditions um, turn out to be great at uh, you know uh, protecting from uh, unknown toxins that the body doesn't know how to deal with. Uh, now, if it gets incorporated with DNA, that's a whole, that's a separate story. I don't think we have a defense mechanism for that. Yeah, and I just want to be totally clear. I don't think it's like uh, you can have your cake and eat it too. Like uh, you can, yeah, like a cheat code for a vaccination or something. I just don't right. think we we know enough about it uh, yet at the moment. Okay, so uh, okay, let me read. We have a lot, we've been having a lot of donations, 
And since YouTube has, YouTube has been covering up the amounts, I've been really lackadaisical on reading these. So uh, let me read these and then we'll jump into articles and then we'll take calls. And we haven't done that for a long time. So that should be very fun. Are you excited about that, Georgie? Of course I'm excited. <laughs> I'm going to drink three other Cokes out of excitement. <laughs> Okay, uh, guys, thank you so much. Give a like uh, to the show. That really helps us, and um, we appreciate it. And also subscribe to t.me slash Roddy, and you can keep up with the show and all the updates uh, that we give out. Okay, so Janet Pack, Linda Bell, Michelle, Jean Pack, Jan, Space 99 Yak, Michael, Kana, uh, Michelle, um, Jean, Janet again, uh, Muhammad, Space Yak again, Peggy. Uh, who are these? Where are these other people? Um, okay. Uh, Kyle, our very own Kyle <laughs> Mamunis. Hey, brother. KT, James M, Linda Bell, Joseph Weiss, Peggy, Ellie, Muhammad, Go- Goli, Goli, uh, Tosh Lawson. Guys, thank you so much. I didn't read your names last episodes. Sincerely appreciate it. Okay. That's not, I don't want to show that yet. <laughs> okay. Let me do a small advertising here. Okay. Uh, let me do that last. Um, you can follow me on the Danny Roddy weblog on Instagram.com slash the Danny Roddy weblog. And I have a lot of food stuff on here. So people are always asking about this stuff. And okay, Instagram. Okay, we'll just switch here. You can follow Georgie on uh, Twitter.com slash hate it and uh, IDLabsDC.com, his boutique, boutique supplement company. Georgie, what are you working on right now? Uh, resuming the studies, uh, basically, uh, as like as I said before, the uh, the scientific group in Bulgaria, uh, because they endured a shutdown, uh, everything was closed down, but now they're starting to reopen, and the lab in Taiwan has been fully reopened, so now we've already resumed uh, the study with DHT and prostate cancer, uh, one with pregnenolone and breast cancer, which I think will be great because it, we, we already have the in vitro study, which I can send you the report. Uh, which showed that uh, basically pregnenolone is only slightly weaker than tamoxifen in treating breast cancer, but but actually with the notable lack of toxicity. And this in vitro model that they use, one of the signs of toxicity is the leakage of lactate dehydrogenase, LDH, from the cell, mm-hmm. um, which in mainstream medicine is considered as a great sign. You're destroying the tumor cells and whatnot. But actually, oncologists know very well that if your levels of LDH rise, it's one of the most reliable predictors of impending death from cancer, Mm -hmm. regardless of how well you've obliterated the tumor. Um, And the pregnenolone, basically, like, uh, I mean, because it's an in vitro study, you can't really look at the mechanism, but pregnenolone completely inhibited the growth of the breast cancer cells without causing any LDH LDH leakage. The Taiwanese lab was amazed. They said, what exactly is this? Because we didn't tell them initially. We just just said it's it's a steroid. And we said it's pregnenolone. They said, well, you may want to do an in vivo study because if that thing works the same way in vivo, you have a blockbuster drug. And I said, well, it can't be patented. They said, you need to think about ways to patent it. No, (laughs) we just want to go back to the old days where things were done for fun and for general, you know, for like uh, mankind's benefit. But the Chinese <laughs> got very suspiciously interested. So I wouldn't be surprised if they try to synthesize some kind of a derivative and patent it themselves. Because I looked at the contract that we have with the lab. It says that they're they're, they're not allowed to take our chemical. Well, actually, even, even if they do, it's it's not non-patentable. They can take pregnenol anytime they want. But they're allowed to de- design and develop derivative chemicals um, if they think the results are promising. So if you start seeing some new drugs coming out of China that are based on pregnenolone and they're treating breast cancer with no toxicity, chances are they, <laughs> that's that's what spurred it. Not China, not China, but maybe Taiwan. Good to know. Uh, also uh, disheartening. <laughs> okay, any of these, what did I put in the title of the show? I don't think I put any of them. What w- Any of these that you're excited about? Uh, well, I think the depression one is is probably the most uh, the good, one that many idea. people yeah. will like uh, will like because you know uh, as I mentioned in the in, in the blog post many times when 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 the study comes out that basically starts to trash serotonin the mainstream media will twist it and actually they'll, if the study talks about the serotonin transporter mm-hmm. basically that lower levels of serotonin transporter are are, are indicative or predictive of depression mm-hmm. the media will just drop the transporter and say lower levels of serotonin predict the development of depression it's happened it's been happening for you know for for years if not for decades but this study was in this article in the mainstream press actually called it right they said basically that that depression only fades away after 
the the expression of the serotonin transporters increases. Mm -hmm. In other words, you only get out of depression after your serotonin gets deactivated. Mm -hmm. um, and they also, I think they all, that study also cited the other one uh, that came out in 2017, serotonin and upper or down. Oh yeah, yeah, the Paul Andrews one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the it's the evidence I think at this point is uh, has already acquired critical mass, and they're saying directly that uh, looking red, they said this challenges the pre the prevailing theory about serotonin and depression, uh, because the serotonin hypothesis can no longer be defended. Um, this says this finding is somewhat surprising given the dominant theory of serotonin function in depression, the serotonin hypothesis. Now, if you read the actual study in the discussion, they're much more they're much harsher than that. They've been kind of saying that uh, we need a new theory. It's quite obvious that this whole serotonin, low serotonin equals depression thing is absurd. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they actually they use the word absurd. Um, but you know, if you want to get your study published, you gotta you gotta watch your words because uh, the like the really high impact journals they don't like when you rock the boat, uh, not even a little bit. So I was surprised that this actually got published with the wording that it currently has. Yeah, what are the where are these transporters? Do you know the STT? Are they they're just mean, cellular yeah. transporters? Or are they transporting serotonin around the blood? No, they're actually they're cellular transporters, and they stimulate the uptake of serotonin into the platelets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and is. And then the platelets carry it to the lungs, where basically, if you have sufficient carbon dioxide, it can get destroyed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and some of it gets gets uh, deactivated by monoamine. Um, oxidase, mm -hmm. and then you, you can pee it out. That's mm -hmm. why the, one of the most reliable tests for serotonin excess is the 5-HIAA 5-hydroxyindole um, uh, acetic acid, which mm -hmm. is a metabolite of serotonin. Mm -hmm. So basically what they make you do is like, if you if the blood tests are inconclusive, what the doctors do is the so-called 24-hour urinary serotonin test. Mm -hmm. So they give you a bucket and you, they, you collect you, all of your urine for 24 hours mm -hmm. and then they measure the level of this metabolite there. And if it's elevated, you have, you're producing too much serotonin. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about it. And just to complete this thought, what, what is your like elevator pitch of, uh, so I'm sure we have a lot of new listeners like th that are um, turned upside down with thinking that, oh, ser serotonin is something you want to decrease. So what, what is like the function of serotonin in your view? The fu I think the function of serotonin is basically to to lower the the cardinal function, in my opinion, is to lower down met metabolism when the conditions are suboptimal mm -hmm. for the higher organism to survive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and it, in in a very real uh, way, it kind of turns you into a more primitive organism that needs less energy to survive. And really, it makes you focus on the survival. I keep remembering that study about the locusts and the grasshoppers. They were basically the same species. And the only thing that turned them the nice, slender, gregarious, uh, non-cannibalistic, uh, vegetarian, uh, you know, uh, a beautiful green grasshopper into this gray slash brownish, uh, like deformed beast that will eat anything on its path. And it, it will turn, it will start flocking too, right? Mm -hmm. So you're getting these like massive flocks of, of, of locusts. The only, the only thing that turned one into the other was elevation of serotonin as a result of lack of sufficient food. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So really like an environmental stressor, any environmental stressor, if severe enough, leads to the inc to increase of serotonin, then which basically immediately starts to shut down your oxidative phosphorylation, which means all of your higher cognitive functions are declining, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you're turning into a beast, back into the beast in the jungle, except that when people are under the influence of serotonin, they do horrific things that animals normally don't do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe if you really stress them out and they start getting deranged like humans, but the whole thing about like survival of the fittest, nature always red and tooth and claw, you know, <laughs> killing each other left and right for no for no reason. All of that is actually very accurate, but applies to humans, mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. to not to normal, healthy, wild animals. They don't behave that way. Mm -hmm. Did I steal this from you? The uh, gut derived serotonin is multifunctional determinants to fasting adaptation. But this is this is interesting because I think one of the it's a study. Yeah. I mean, I may have posted it, but it's a, it's a study, so you, for you to take it, it's not stealing it. No, I, I know the the but the the serotonin being. I think this is in mice, but if serotonin is upregulated in fasting, again, that another ding against why you do not want to be chronically fasting. I think that's something that's very controversial that we've said on this show many times. 
And uh, the last sentence, that decrease in serotonin could ameliorate type 2 diabetes. Believe mm-hmm. it or not, there are already two clinical trials almost complete with humans using TPH inhibitors, tryptophan mm-hmm. hydroxylase inhibitors. And so far, the trials seem to be capable of treating both. One of them is for obesity. The other one is for diabetes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And both, both are in stage four. So I'm sorry, stage three. So if they're in stage three and still ongoing, um, this means the trials are seeing effectiveness. Otherwise... Um, you know, they'll usually get terminated early because the, when the companies don't like the results, they can actually request that a trial is terminated early. And they're still ongoing. Uh, I think it's two or three years at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we may very well see a tryptophan hydroxylase inhibitor being approved, at which point I don't know how psychiatry will be able to get out in the public again and, and promote <laughs> the serotonin hypothesis yet again. Actually, I do know. They're saying that the TPH inhibitors that are being used are selective only for the enzyme that synthesizes serotonin peripherally because the, the, the TPH has two, two isoforms, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is in the gut and type 2 is in the brain. So I've already seen articles that are saying serotonin does a lot of good things for the brain, but if it gets out of whack peripherally, then bad things happen like obesity, diabetes, etc., etc. So they develop these selective specific drugs that will only inhibit the serotonin synthesis peripherally, but they will leave it untouched in your brain so that so it can do its good there. You know, it can keep you, it can keep depression away. Um, I don't. I don't see how this is going to work because, first of all, I'm not convinced that you can develop a, a TPH-specific inhibitor for only one of the isoenzymes. They're so similar structurally. Mm-hmm. And and if you look at the um, – th- there's the software that can you can give it a, 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 the chemical structure of a, of a compound, and it, and it can give you predictions of what effects it will have on specific enzymes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've looked at the so-called specific TPH1 inhibitors used for diabetes and for obesity, mm-hmm. and the software very clearly predicts it will have even higher affinity for TPH2, so chances are it will lower serotonin in the brain as well. So if that happens as well, I think the serotonin hypothesis is, is toast. Uh, but it, it probably won't happen for another, I don't know, five, ten years, which by that point, Big Pharma, I think, is it already knows that that the hypothesis is dead. Um, they're preparing probably like uh, you know some kind of a pivot, um, or trying to milk it for what it's worth for whatever is remaining before they just uh, turn around and say, "Oops, we were wrong." Uh, guess what? So let's let's try something new now. No apologies, no lawsuits. Um, it, we just didn't know at the time, but uh, we promise we'll do better next time. Yeah, and the OG article is on Ray's website for anybody. Who wants to read more about that? Okay, so let's do one more article and then we'll take a call. Um, what do you feel? I like the almost half of, of obese adults are metabolically healthy. Mm-hmm. That that generated a lot of hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, both on Twitter, but not so much because the comments there are public. And But by email, I started getting I, – there, there are like a few doctors that every once in a while will send me an email mm-hmm. when they're really unhappy about something I've posted. <laughs> <laughs> and and all three of them, there's three of them that that I kind of converse with in an unpleasant manner, uh, or at least they converse with me in a pleasant manner, and I usually don't hold back. And they immediately sent back and said, "This is a ridiculous statistical fluke. Um, we with more studies, the the obesity paradox will go away." I'm like, "It's not only it's not going away; it's getting stronger. Just look at the data. They said this study says 40 percent of obese American adults are metabolically healthy." Now, here's the thing. If that is the case, then think about what happens and whether this, whether the, their doctor ever talks to them about this. Well, probably not because it's a new study, right? But think about what, how 40%, almost half of these obese adults are being pushed to lose weight by starving, by exhaustive exercise, by taking their drugs for blood pressure, for like blood glucose, et cetera, et cetera. But if they're healthy, why bother, right? What was that thing? First, do no harm. So if there's no harm here, if there's no pathology – other than the extra weight, then why is it so hard to accept that maybe some people with a little bit of extra weight, not, I mean, I, I don't know if it's, if there's a if there's a threshold, but I think it's unique. I mean, maybe for some people, the gaining of weight is adaptive and it's basically keeping their metabolic rate higher, maybe in a suboptimal manner, but still better than, than basically the being, being um, um, you know, uh, gaunt and, and not having a sufficient muscle mass and whatnot to sort of keep the metabolic rate at a level that allows for a fully functional adult to run around and live its life. Um, 
what was that? Uh, I think another study came out that we discussed on, I don't know, episode 50, I don't know, uh, 47 or something <laughs> that showed that, that skinny people with a BMI of 27 or lower mm. had, had actually four to five times higher chance of dying from their cancer, no matter what cancer they got. Mm. And actually, they had about the same rates of, of getting the cancer to start with. So the whole thing about obesity being a risk factor for cancer turns out to be the, the the link is there, but it's very weak, and it's only for two or three cancers, like colon cancer, I think pancreatic, um, and I think um, what was that other one? Um, not lung. Um, it was another another digestive related uh, gastric, yeah, mm-hmm, gastric mm-hmm, cancer. Mm-hmm. So so only only basically cancers of the digestive system, and that's not surprising because usually higher weight obesity is correlated with endotoxemia. Uh, so those cancers are they know they're known to have an endo, an endotoxin uh, link. All cancers do, but these ones are specifically uh, strongly linked to it. Um, so all of this talk about like obesity being a risk factor for cancer turns out the evidence is not there. And now we know that it's also in half of them it's also not linked to cardiovascular disease. So all I mean, so you know, take it with a grain of salt. But all that means to me is that the the medical industry is terrified that half of its patients will maybe wake up one day and walk away and say, you know what? Yes, I may not be looking skinny like a model, or maybe I shouldn't or should, who knows, but I'm not taking these drugs anymore and I'm not going to torture myself to death just so that I can drop a few pounds, which I will regain and probably put on more the moment I stop this horrific diet that probably people in concentration camps would think it's a, it's a feast. Yeah, so let's break this down because this is another contra- very controversial thing that I think we say on this show repeatedly. So a uh, a larger person is storing the PUFA, whereas maybe a, a skinnier person is burning that fat and being exposed to more lipid peroxidation, more um, neuroprostanes and isoprostanes and prostaglandins and things like that. Is is that the idea? If the person is being forced to be lean, if mm-hmm. the person is naturally, which which usually goes along with higher meta- basal metabolic rate and good liver function, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. If they have a suffi- sufficient muscle mass mm-hmm. and then they're staying lean, that's usually a good sign because it means the liver is capable of excreting most, if not all, of the PUFA. Mm-hmm. But if with advancing age, with a mo- metabolic rate going lower, you're losing the muscle mass, right? Um, and then base and and the, the liver is starting to malfunction. Then then whatever PUFA you eat you'll probably tend to not be able to excrete as quickly as you want through gluconidation, mm-hmm. which means you have only two choices left. You, you either oxidize it or you store it. But the oxidation process of PUFA is terrible for all organs. Um, so it's the lesser evil to store it and maybe accumulate a little bit of extra weight than constantly being forced to burn it through exercise, fasting, I don't know, like uh, taking some kind of a drug that increases fatty acid oxidation, like metformin. Um, which ironically now they're promoting is the, the cure or the prevention of cancer, but all of the human trials so far with cancer and metformin have flopped abysmally. Uh, in fact, it drastically accelerated the, the death rate. I think the last one they tried it for is colon cancer. Um, and because the people with diabetes tend to have a high risk of colon cancer, they said, oh, if metformin is a drug for diabetes, maybe it will help prevent or you know treat the colon cancer or at least slow it down. That did not did not work. It did not happen. Yeah, this drives with my limited personal experience of talking to people. It's like leanness is, does not equal health in any uh, way, shape, or form. There is a study mm-hmm. which you and I discussed on intermittent fasting mm-hmm, mm-hmm. about that doctor from Stanford University who was actually himself an oh, intermittent yeah, yeah. faster mm-hmm, for mm-hmm. seven years. And his quote was uh, like losing weight apparently is very rarely mm-hmm. correlated with good health outcome. Mm-hmm. Now, being lean you know it's it's a sign of usually being healthy if you're not stressing yourself if you're not doing it through fasting exercise or other forceful means but forcing people who are overweight to lose their weight through any of these stressful methods you uh, invariably backfires and by the way intermittent fasting it's probably one of the less stressful ways where uh, through which you can lose this extra fat it's it's because it actually tends to lower your endotoxin because uh, when you don't eat um you know and, and i think ray kind of said that too he said like yeah fasting has its benefits but after a few days you know you start getting into the whole like starvation uh, alarm signal state but but if you're doing intermittent fasting it may have some benefits due to the to the reduction of, of endotoxin however uh, intermittent fasting is not that widely uh, practiced the usual thing that a doctor will prescribe is intense aerobic quote exercise because there's nothing aerobic about it 
um, if you're building up lactic acid. And if you're losing weight through that method, through the the extensive, exhaustive, crushing aerobic endurance exercise, then uh, you, you're definitely doing more harm than, than just allowing that, that fat to be stored. Um, and then, you know, gradually releasing it and, you know, helping the, uh, getting it excreted through the liver, which means if you're overweight and you want to lose it the proper way, then you should probably be supporting liver health and trying to build muscle mass because the muscle mass, whatever the liver cannot handle, the muscles prefer to oxidize fat at rest. So having giant muscles or at least as big as possible is a great way to lose fat while you sleep. It's the ultimate dream of the couch potato. You just lie <laughs> on your couch and you get lean. Okay, so I just put the number on the screen. Give us a call, and we'll see how the system fares for these call-ins. Um, what else is new, Georgie? Like uh, last time we talked about preparedness. Is there anything new that you've been doing in this this last? Oh, okay, we have a call. <laughs> oh, wow, that let, was that was quick. Let me see. Okay. Okay. Hello. Can you, can you hear us? Hello. Okay. Hello. Hey, I can't believe this works. Yeah, hey, me either. My <laughs> I really have no questions. I just want to say thanks for doing what you're doing. That's it. Have a good one. <laughs> I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. So so did you guys in the chat actually hear the person that called Georgie? You heard that too? Uh, of course. That's why I'm doing the thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. That's amazing. Did, let me just do a confirmation in the chat that you, you guys actually heard. Michael is saying how to call from Mexico. I think just using the, uh, I always call f using Skype out. And so just using the country code plus one. Okay. So, so that worked. That's cr crazy. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Caller. Uh, we're again, we're open to other calls. Uh, you guys can, uh, call in. And what was I asking you about preparedness, Georgie? But preparedness. Yeah. I haven't done much, uh, or, or anything really since we last talked because I just read the news and frankly, at this point with the inflation ongoing, um, uh, there isn't uh, unless you've already done a significant amount of preparation. I think the best thing you can do going forward, um, other than freaking out, is just you know make sure you have some canned food, some some of the most uh, you know um, emergency uh, helpful drugs such as antibiotics, mm -hmm. thyroid, progesterone. Um, you know, maybe maybe cyproheptadine or any kind of anti-serotonin like Benadryl would be a, a you know a very I'm, good I'm gonna, second. Option. I'm gonna pause you right there and take this call. Okay, hello, caller. Your name and where you're calling from. Hello, Lucas. Lu Lucas, Australia. Lucas, what's up? What's your question? Oh, you know what, Lucas? Can you turn turn off the the with the YouTube? It's gonna it's gonna feed back into your call. Yo, Danny, it's Lucas here. Um, and Georgie, what's up, man? Um, just wanted to say huge thank you for all that you got you, you guys are doing. It's um. It's a pleasure listening in. My question is for Georgie in relation to, um, he mentioned a cyproheptidine alternative that he's looking at, a specific like serotonin antagonist. I'd love to hear some updates on like where that's at. Awesome. I'm so, going gonna, gonna to hang up on you, Lucas, but th thank you so much. Awesome. Okay. Take care, brother. Uh, I think it affects the, the sound quality a little bit. So that's why I did that. But go ahead, Georgie. I mean, so the ones that are available, you can buy the ones that I just, as I kind of mentioned, as part of the prepping thing, uh, Benadryl, the, I think the chemical name is diphenhydramine, um, and and some of the, uh, so the anti-acid drug famotidine turns out to be a potent uh, serotonin depleter or antagonist. We don't know yet, but it was capable of stopping a full-blown serotonin syndrome, which would have probably killed the person because once it really uh, uh, gets severe, like an acute severe serotonin syndrome, about 40% of people die. So famotidine was injected at a dosage of 20 milligrams mm -hmm. uh, and immediately stopped it, which even cyproheptin sometimes struggles to do. Um, and there are older studies showing that because famotidine uh, is an antagonist of the histamine 2 receptor, which people thought was mostly expressed um, in the gut, but it turns out it's also expressed in the brain and, and blocking that receptor apparently has a, some kind of a psych, uh, feedback mechanism um, and it lowers the, the, the production of serotonin in, uh, in both the brain and peripherally. Um, that's my explanation. It could also be a serotonin antagonist like cyproheptadine, but I suspect the more likely version is famotidine actually acts similar to a TPH inhibitor because it de decreases the synthesis of serotonin. 
uh, and it's available over the counter in most countries. The only problem is if you if you're buying the commercial version, which comes in a pill, um, it usually comes with some not very nice excipients like talc and titanium dioxide and sometimes silica and sometimes some artificial colors. Um, you know, it's not ideal, but if that's your only option, it's probably better than nothing, especially if you're dealing with severe serotonin issues or society is collapsing. Um, <laughs> and then other things you can do, other, other anti-serotonin, but they're usually by prescription only, are the older uh, tricyclic antidepressants, such as nortriptyline, amitriptyline, um, and some of, some of the reincarnations, such as myanserine, which I think is available in Australia, myanserine, also known as mirtazapine. Um, but all of these are, you know, by prescription only. So your best bets for over-the-counter would be diphenhydramine, also known as Benadryl, and fabotidine. Um, and then, of course, variety of other anti-serotonin. The variety of the chemicals that we're discussing here have anti-serotonin effects like pregnenolone, progesterone, uh, aspirin, um, especially DHEA, uh, the Studies going back to the 1940s demonstrate that whenever the end, the amount of androgens in males, at least in the body, rises, the whole serotonin system gets kind of quieted down. Um, uh, gets gets it's it's if its effects and activity gets suppressed, and that may be one of the reasons why um, androgens have known antidepressant effect in both men and women. Um, so if you can get access to anti-serotonin chemicals, um, you know I guess the the steroids. The ones that are available are your are second best bet. Uh, thank you, Lucas. What was the first person's name? Do you remember? I don't think you said it. Okay. Thank you, first, first caller. Thank you, Lucas. Okay, we have one more here. Uh, okay. Uh, your name and where you're calling from. Can you hear us, caller? You got to oh, you, you got to turn off the YouTube or you'll it will feed back <laughs> into the thing. <laughs> All right, sorry. Let me let me do that. No worries. Take your time. Um, I, this is Jordan, Jordan from Pennsylvania. Thanks. What's your question, Jordan? How are you? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks, guys. I watch every video, uh, <laughs> like following everything. It's learning a lot. Uh, question for you guys. Um, I've been doing a lot of, of dietary things that you guys suggest and repeat as well. And I'm curious. I constantly have this issue with acid reflux. And I'm wondering what you guys think regarding that. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna hang up on you and Jordan just to increase the quality, but thank you so much for calling, Jordan. The thing. Thanks, uh, guys. Okay, thanks, brother. Okay. Acid reflux. What do you think, Jordan? Yes, the esophageal <laughs> sphincter is now known to be weakened by cortisol, like many other sphincter issues. Um, and basically, um, uh, there are older studies demonstrating that uh, giving drugs that either block the effects of cortisol or weaken its effects or decrease its synthesis can actually um, can actually r restore the strength of the esophageal sphincter, and then it closes down fully uh, when when a person eats food, so it doesn't let the acid go back up. Uh, also, some recent studies demonstrated that the GERD. Uh, uh, the GERD condition is actually not so much related to acid, but it's actually an inflammatory condition of the esophagus itself. And I think that the specific animal study that looked at the, at the issue managed to actually fully treat it by administering glycine, the amino acid glycine, to the animals. So eating maybe a little bit of uh, a gelatin with each meal, maybe just a tablespoon, um, would be able to like uh, tone down the symptoms even if the acid continues to sort of uh, regurgitate back into the esophagus from the stomach, but also taking some progesterone, um, pregnenolone, DHEA, aspirin, any of the other anti-cortisol uh, uh, interventions that we know uh, may be able to help as well. Um, there is a study with children which demonstrated that cyproheptidine, uh, I think the title it says cyproheptidine um, has great promise for functional GI disorders in children. If you look at that study, some of the children that study actually had GERD and cyproheptidine managed to cure it or at least made it disappear. Uh, and I suspect that one of the reasons is that any, any drug with anti-serotonin effects tends to drastically decrease the production of cortisol. Um, and, and it's known that when you take cyproheptidine, muscle strength improves and also the sphincter itself, because it's also a muscle uh, that probably affects not just your skeletal muscles, but muscles inside the body as well, the smooth muscle system. Um, and that's probably why serotonin helped in these GI functional 
um, um, uh, disorders in the children. It was a wide variety of them. I think some children had IBS. Others had basically dyspepsia in digestion. Others had full-blown GERD. Um, s- still others had like, um, what was the name of it? Um, uh, basically had uh, issues with too much gas, which usually signals, uh, you know, bacterial overgrowth. So serotonin was helpful for all of them, but I'm specifically mentioning because it, you know, it, it, it turned out to be really effective for, for acid reflux. And I think the mechanism of action is it's and the anti-serotonin effects decreasing the, the, the synthesis of cortisol. Yeah, I just put this up on the Ray email wiki to and as an ancillary to what you just said. But um, the, when I had I had experienced this in San Francisco, like the gastric reflux, and I remember taking one dose of penicillin made it go away, and so it made me think that Ray was on so, onto something because he said and bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine are often involved, um, and obviously going along with what you just said about serotonin. I have a, a few clients who reported that taking progesterone orally mm-hmm, also mm-hmm. also almost made their not fully but got it to the point where they they didn't need to take their acid drugs anymore much to the infuriation of their doctor <laughs> who thought that they'll be you know they'll be dutifully taking this for life but no they switched to another drug. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Jordan. Uh, sincerely appreciate it. Uh, do you want to take one more call and then go sure. to articles? Okay, so this person has been calling multiple times here. Okay. <laughs> Waiting. Okay, caller, you are on air. What is your name and where are you calling from? My name is Eric from Seattle. Hey, Eric. How are, how are you, sir? Good. I was wondering, um, you know anything about quorum sensing in bacteria? And the reason I bring that up is I've seen a study where this bacteria are using serotonin to communicate. And I guess could that be a lot of the benefits of coming? You're inhibiting bacterial growth, like in your intestines. I just kind of wonder your thoughts on that. Did you catch that full question, Jordan? I uh, was talking about bacterial quorum and bacteria using serotonin to communicate. Yeah, what was the bacteria, Eric? Yeah. Quorum, quorum sensing in the study. The bacteria was on like a. Let me try to see if I can find it real quick. Like Pseudomonas agar. I don't know. It's like a little complex name. But they said <laughs> they, they used ser- <laughs> use serotonin to, to communicate quorum sensing. Mm-hmm. So have you heard of that? Like quorum sensing molecule, that bacteria used to communicate with each other. And they use it to, they were going to, you know, produce biofilm or you know yeah. become virulent. You know. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> Do you really think about it, or I don't know. <laughs> I've I've seen many studies showing that serotonin, basically, when when the bacteria feels threatened. Um, or, or it, for whatever reason, serotonin gets released by the chromaffin cells uh, that are lining up the intestine wall. Basically, the bacteria gets agitated and increases its turnover, which leads to the overproduction of endotoxin, which leads to even more production of serotonin. So basically, that's why that's one reason why it's not a good idea to disturb your intestine. So things like twisting it or getting punched in the stomach, obviously not a good thing, right? But even things like you know running for a few miles, it's actually enough in many people to trigger diarrhea. Um, I don't know if you've seen these footages of people running marathons. Yeah, yeah. Quite a few of them very literally shit their pants <laughs> while running. Um, and basically some of some of them um, have collapsed and died at the finish line. And when they were, did aut- autopsies, these people had like fibrotic disease in their GI tract and their lungs. Long story short, serotonin is a communication mechanism for any bacteria, almost any bacteria species that are living in your gastrointestinal system. And that may be one reason why taking anti-serotonin drugs uh, very often leads to resolving uh, IBS, both the constipation version and the diarrhea. Uh, because when you when you decrease or at least block the effects of serotonin, I think it leads to drastic decline in the in the amount of bacteria. Basically, it it um, it uh, uh, what should I call it? It, it leads to the to the to the uh, decrease in the size of the bacterial colony, mm-hmm. and also I think it also it decreases the synthesis of that biofilm, so the bacteria get more vulnerable to antibiotics. So maybe like a good uh, regimen would be if you take the, the cyproheptadin or any other serotonin and you feel a benefit, but it doesn't completely resolve, maybe take that with the low-dose antibiotic and it will probably work much better than, than either one of uh, on their own. But yeah, serotonin yeah. is much more than simply a byproduct of bacterial uh, uh, metabolism and, and, um, and turnover. 
it's actually used by them to uh, to agitate the rest of the colony, and it's like a it's the alarm signal for them as well. It basically says things are not going well, and uh, we need to procreate, and we need to increase in number. And the ones that are dying, they're basically rupturing and releasing the endotoxin from their outer wall. Usually, only the gram-negative versions have it. But I think there's also some. Uh, I think I've seen studies that show that increasing serotonin also switches, uh, shifts the balance of the microbiome from the mix between gram-negative and gram-positive towards more gram-negative ones, which are not only the ones producing the endotoxin, but also the ones that are much more difficult to treat with antibiotics. So, so yeah, I mean, blocking serotonin is probably a good way, very good way to resolve digestive issues for many people and for the ones that are basically not resolving them but abating them. If you add an antibiotic, you may be able to really kill off and remove that biofilm that may have been sitting there for years and uh, causing you digestive problems that are baffling doctors. Yeah, the uh, the pyrocet, the, the ingredients in there, I've seen some studies that they inhibit the quorum sensing among some other things like vitamin K, I think vitamin E, you know, there's like a you, bunch of things. But yeah. Right. It was the ethyl pyruvate, right? That's the recent study that showed that uh, inhibited the quorum. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you, you may want to try, I mean, if you're using the pyroset, uh, a few people reported, I don't know if you frequent the repeat forum, but a few people reported that putting just a few drops, like two or three in their belly button, uh, basically got rid of long, like long living, long running digestive symptoms that they had. And there, there's another study which was about the other ingredient in the pyroset, the ethyl acetoacetate, showing that it may be a good alternative to antibiotics if there is a way to get it to the colon before getting metabolized before that in the stomach and the small intestine, just like coconut oil. If there was a way to get co enough coconut oil to your colon, it would work just as well as antibiotics. It's just the problem is it gets absorbed and metabolized before that. So the, by doing it through the belly button, I think a sufficient amount of it may get to the actual digestive tract without getting metabolized, and 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 the, and the, and and uh, not, it will get absorbed but not metabolized, and then you may have a sufficient antibiotic effect, um, and then the etopyruvate inhibiting the quorum sensing as well, um, maybe contributing to these. Uh, it's really quite striking. One person said they had constipation for a decade. And nothing helped, not even Linzess, which is like the commercial drug for it. And they started using the pyroset um, in just two or three drops in the navel. And then basically the floodgates opened, the proverbial floodgates, and they don't have constipation anymore. Amazing, amazing. I'll give that a try. Cool. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. Take care, brother. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye. Okay, let's do – how long have we been doing this? Okay, 110. Okay, let's do another article, and then we'll – do some more calls and then maybe article and then call it a night. Okay. Um, what? <laughs> any, other, any of these that you had just pick, an, I mean, an affinity for? To me, it's just, let's see. Uh, I like the ones that you are about jazzed about. And telomeres. We already covered that, right? I oh, the many people may suffer from chronic serotonin syndrome. Okay. That, I think that, that actually fit the theme uh, of the a show. A quite surprised. Yes. Um, First of all, I don't think medicine recognizes chronic serotonin syndrome as a condition. Mm -hmm. They only recognize the acute version. Uh, even for that, they're very poorly trained to recognize it and diagnose it. If you show up in the hospital with with disorientation, changes in, me in mental status, uh, shivering, uh, myoclonus, which is you know muscle twitching jerks and things like that, mm -hmm. they will probably think you're in withdrawal. Uh, of like uh, you're basically a hardcore junkie or an alcoholic, <laughs> and you and you sort of, and you seeking a gelatin junkie, term. like you said uh, last time. A gelatin junkie, like a you gelatin said. Gelatin junkie, exactly. <laughs> um, and they'll probably like uh, you know scorn you and say like, how dare you come here and waste like v valuable bed space in the ER when there's like p real people with real problems. Um, but actually, they're they're kind of on the right path because most of the symptoms, the hardcore symptoms of withdrawal, are caused by serotonin. And a little bit of adrenaline as well. This is why drugs like clonidine, which which block the effects of adrenaline, actually lower the the amounts of adrenaline in the body, and also cortisol. And now they're now they're, it's also uh, having a, a partial anti serotonin effect. This is why clonidine is now used successfully to treat uh, even even very severe cases of withdrawal from opiates. Um, and they're they're physically addictive, so it's not a pleasant sight. People that have that are withdrawing from these drugs or, or alcohol can actually die from the withdrawal symptoms. Um, if you people remember the singer, the British singer Amy Winehouse, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, she actually died from alcohol withdrawal, not the alcohol itself, but from the alcohol withdrawal period because she was heavily addicted to alcohol. 
uh, her doctor convinced her to stop cold turkey. She actually called the doctors and the symptoms that she gave. I mean, I can't diagnose her over the phone and I'm not a doctor, but she had all of these symptoms that you're seeing here mentioned. Um, and she was, uh, she, she told the doctor she's, she's afraid that she's going to go into a, to a seizure. She felt like really agitated and overexcited. The doctor told her, ah, it's not a big deal. Um, you know, it's every alcoholic trying to dry out is going through these problems. Don't be a crybaby. Call me in 48 hours. And apparently she had a seizure and died. Mm -hmm. Um, but basically now the study is saying there is actually a chronic version of serotonin syndrome with all of those symptoms, just not that pronounced. And, and unfortunately, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to resolve by itself. And even more unfortunately, it seems a significant portion of people are in that state, especially people on serotonergic drugs, which tells me that th the majority of people on SSRI drugs, especially the ones taking the high doses, I don't know how many people have met a person like that. Almost all of them meet the criteria for chronic serotonin syndrome described here. They all have extreme irritability. They're all agitated. They all, they all have these rigid movements. Uh, they can't sit down still. Um, they always have, have, uh, feel a need to constantly move. Uh, they have insomnia, many of them. It's a known side effect of the SSRI drugs. So really, these drugs are priming you, are actually putting you in a state of chronic serotonin syndrome, and as the article says, it's very troubling because, first of all, it doesn't resolve, tends to not resolve by itself for as long as you continue to take the the, the, the agent causing it, right? And two, in about 30% of the cases, tends to unpredictably trans transform into the acute version, which is has a very high lethality rate, even with treatment. Um, so just to draw attention to the fact that serotonin is no laughing matter, um, medicine kind of recognizes that tongue-in-cheek uh, but it only, you know, very, uh, very carefully without, you know, because they try not to upset the pharma industry selling the SSRI drugs. And they only recognize in regards to the acute serotonin syndrome. But apparently a significant portion of the population is already in that state. Um, and they're just waiting for the uh, quote unquote right trigger to, to push them over the edge. And once over the edge, um, it's really da very dangerous because it's lethal, uh, it, very high percentage of lethality. Most doctors are trained not to recognize it and not to diagnose it, probably out of fear to not expose serotonin for what it actually does. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and now uh, I've uh, spoken to a doctor friend of mine who works in an ER, or at least used to it. He said that he hasn't seen cyproheptadine in the ER department of his hospital for years. Um, they basically, like, I don't know if he didn't know if they ran out or he simply thought it's not useful anymore because the, uh, the, the, the case of serotonin syndrome that arrive in the ER are like so few in between, far, far, uh, few and far in between. Uh, but basically, it's you don't want to be, you don't want to end up with an acute serotonin syndrome in the hospital because your doctor may actually just yell at you and kick you out. And even even if they uh, uh, you know acknowledge that you have a serotonin problem, they may not have the means to treat it um, unless they've heard of that study study on famotidine. But I doubt they are because it's only a case study and uh, they, they're really trying to not interfere with serotonin. I know of, of a psychiatrist who actually has patients and he knows about serotonin syndrome. He knows about the risks of those drugs, but he has been convinced that they're so rare that he has no problem uh, jacking up the dosage when one of his patients calls and says, oh, I have these symptoms that are clearly like relevant it's a very good possibility it's a serotonin it's acute serotonin syndrome and in response the doctor says no you're just in withdrawal or you're you you have you experience an acute exacerbation of your depressive symptoms which by the way all of the symptoms that you saw for chronic serotonin syndrome are also symptoms of serotonin exacerbation so guess what the doctor does jacks up their dosage of the ssri uh, because that's what they're taught to do so very uh, willingly or unwillingly, they may be killing quite a few of these people uh, simply because they think it's the right thing to do, just increase their drug because, um, you know, a psychiatrist has already kind of given up on depression to treat it with uh, with behavioral therapy modification. It's now mostly, uh, uh, you know, done, de dealt with, with drugs. Um, it's more profitable, you can handle more patients, and that's the way it is. So anyways... No serotonin syndrome, no laughing matter, and and th there may be quite a few people around you that are with it. So learn to recognize the signs slash symptoms, and if these people start to exhibit them, um, I don't know, maybe um, I don't know if you if if it would help to take them to the ER because the ER very often would not help them, uh, would probably kick them out. 
So maybe if you have a famotidine or cyproheptadine or Benadryl, try to you know you know help them out and 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 have them uh, take a pill or two. But with the Benadryl, be careful. In doses over 150 milligrams, it starts to act as an SSRI. So even though it will be a, a partial serotonin antagonist, there is no telling which one of these two effects will actually take over. So if you're giving too much Benadryl, you may be exacerbating the, the serotonin syndrome. So if you're using Benadryl, no more than, I would say, even 100 milligrams. Typical doses are 25 to 50. That's plenty. Uh, Cyproheptadine is best. It's actually the official treatment for serotonin syndrome. And if you don't have that, then famotidine would be the other thing I would try. And if, if you have, don't have any of these, um, some st older studies in animals show that a hefty dosage of aspirin may be able to stop it as well. Um, and the uh, human equivalent doses were about a gram to a gram and a half, which though it sounds high, uh, it's really not that much for a human. Um, and if you take it with something like gelatin, um, it should remove pretty much any any gastrointestinal symptoms if if aspirin even gives you any. Um, so that will be my that, that will be what I will try. Speaking of signs and symptoms, uh, where is it? Uh, the prolactin can be a proxy for uh, serotonin. Is that right? That's right, serotonin and estrogen, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> because estrogen uh, very often is very high. Uh, it has a high, very high accumulation rate inside of the cell, and especially in postmenopausal women, because their ovaries are no longer functioning, uh, and the ovaries produce estradiol, which medicine, for some strange reason, thinks is the only relevant estrogen for human health. So if your estradiol is low, by definition, medicine says you are a low estrogen phenotype. That's not true. You also produce estrone, and especially the estrone sulfate, which is the long-lived version of estrone. And that one, even though weaker than estradiol, is still a significantly potent estrogen capable of activating the estrogen receptor itself and can easily get converted into estradiol as needed. Uh, but because most doctors do not test for estrone and almost never test for estrone sulfate, um, basically, if your estradiol is low, they'll say your estrogen is low. But you could be having all of these symptoms such as hot flashes, gynecomastia in males, uh, varicose veins, especially on the extremities um, or on the face. Um, it's also a sign of liver dysfunction. And we know that estrogen is involved in liver dysfunction as well. Uh, so if your estrogen tests are coming back, quote unquote, normal or even low, ask for a test uh, for, to, for the doctor to do a test in prolactin. If the prolactin comes back in the upper 50th percentile even because they keep moving the range up and normalizing it, um, normalizing an abnormal range. If your prolactin is in the upper 50th percentile of the normal range, your total body load of estrogen is not low. It cannot be. Yeah, I barely ever see a prolactin uh, less than 10, and I think 10 is probably too high. Um, okay, so let me do an advertisement, and do you guys still have the number? Okay, so let me post the number down in the chat here. Thank you, everybody in the chat. We always have super oh, good I'm chats. I don't even ever need to moderate them. So thank you, guys. Um, so I'm going to do this ad, and then whoever's calling when I'm finished, we will answer the question. Okay, so let me start with – I didn't even open up my thing. Okay, I do coaching on patreon.com slash Danny Roddy. I think it's sold out at the moment. Um you can <laughs> follow me on twitter.com slash Danny Roddy or rather t.me slash Danny Roddy. And I've been up updating that with show updates and content, uh, content and things. You can follow me on instagram.com uh, slash the Danny Roddy weblog. And I have uh, food content on here, which everybody likes. Also, is vitamin D3 toxic? Georgie, is it toxic? <laughs> Come on, man. Are you kidding me? Oh, speaking of which, I forgot to send you that study. Uh. Um, a person with end stage pancreatic cancer started taking 50,000 units, five zero, <laughs> daily. And then uh, at, at the last checkup, refused all other interventions because they told him, the, the, I think it was, he, it was a he. He, well, I don't even know if I should be using this pronoun anymore, but let's use he. <laughs> <laughs> don't start with me. He, <laughs> he was terminal, was told that, you know, he, he could try chemo or radiation or surgery. Uh, I don't think he was a candidate for surgery. At stage four, he, it's already metastasized and... Uh, uh, it cannot really be. It's it's considered inoperable. But they did offer uh, chemotherapy and radiation. He said no. Started taking fifty thousand units of vitamin D three daily, and then all subsequent checkups showed that the cancer was stopped. It did not develop anymore. And at the last checkup, which they did sixteen months later, the disease was stable and in regression. 
And then the, the person simply after that stops, stop going to the doctor, which I would probably do too if I'm in the same condition and it turns out that I can have remedies at my disposal that work miraculously better compared to what the doctors have to offer. It reminds me of that story of the person from Greece who went back, who was who got diagnosed with stage four lung cancer um, and then uh, basically decided to go back. He was originally from Greece, decided to go back to Greece, die in peace, you know, just not burden his family with expensive funeral, funeral in the United States. Went back to Greece, met up with his old friends, um, started, you know, cultivating his vineyard, um, you know, started started making some wine for the people to have to drink at his funeral. Um, he somehow forgot to die um, and then kept forgetting dying. <laughs> and then three years later, went back to the United States for, for a checkup. His cancer had disappeared. And then he went back again. I think it was 12 years later. His cancer was still gone. No sign of it. And every single one of the doctors of the oncologist that he saw while he was there were already dead, many of them from cancer itself, from cancer as well. Yeah, you know, I wish I w we would never talk about it ever again, but I get emails every other day about it. And so it's <laughs> it's been talked about so many times on this show. I have content about it on Twitter, Instagram, Telegram. Uh, I think Deep State is spurring these conversations because it's one of the ways to 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 trigger. This is shit posting, right? Isn't that the definition of shit posting or trolling? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I I think it's just that it's just the okay. So I just want to say I think their intentions are probably mostly good. It's it's. It's our buddy Matt. I think it's uh, Morley Robbins and the, and the well, other it's dude. It's not a coincidence that it's such controversial topics. Remember the discussion about vitamin A. I mean, like it's some. It seems that it's certain some of these some of these interventions that are probably more benign than even taking the steroids. And for some reason, people are saying, "Oh, it's used as rat poison." But uh, the fact that the rats have a much higher expression of the enzyme that converts cholic calciferol into calcitriol, and it's the calcitriol that kills them. Um, that somehow never gets mentioned. Or the fact that actually they used to use calcitriol as rat poison, but then a Big Pharma said, nah, we want to use that as a prescription drug. How about you stop selling it as rat poison because people are just going to start buying rat poison and probably taking it themselves. Switch to something else. So that's how they, they switch to the to the D3 version. But it's in reality, it's the, it's the calcitriol killing the rats, even if they're being treated with cholecalciferol. I would just be skeptical because I, I just think it's like a niche uh, health view you, that's proliferated very fast, you know, because I think I think it just uh, blossomed at the perfect time because I think carnivore was at, on its way out. Like, I think that that diet just took a huge nosedive in the, the yeah. diet scene. And I think Morley Robbins was so that's like another kind of like Ray Pete person, like older man who has these wild ideas about minerals and copper and things. And so I think he was at, he was um, there. Are you sure that's not Jibo reincarnated? I mean, that, <laughs> I don't know. That who that, I don't know who that is. <laughs> so ah. the, 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 I think the carnivore diet dipped and then Morley was there to kind of ha have a new view. And so it's like the Ray Pete and the Morley Robbins. And, and so those ideas are popular in alt health right now. And, and, and so again, if anybody is, I have so much content on this and you could watch this video. I think it's of you asking Ray about the high dose vitamin D, but um, I don't know how I could make it any more clear, but I am, I am the biggest vitamin D fan on the internet. I am so pro vitamin D and I think it's so helpful. And that's why I'm semi emotional about this argument that I think it's tragic that people are um, saying it's so risky and, and you, and you, it, it shouldn't be taken because I, I, I think in my own health experience that it's been so supportive of allowing me to like, I don't, I don't go into this that much, but I think I had liver damage after carnivore. Like I think I had some low grade ascites and vitamin D was a, a thing that I knew helped me like function. And like, and so again, it's, um, I didn't even say that on like the vitamin D debate, but I'm, I'm just, uh, again, huge vitamin D fan. So yeah. Anything else? To add to that? <laughs> well, I don't want to, Pour more like butter into the fire, oil into the fire. <laughs> but but again, it's uh, if it didn't come up, we never have to talk about it again. But it comes up all the time. Okay, um, what else do I want to say here? Uh, follow Georgie on twittercom slash it. And one more time, Georgie, tell us about ID Labs, even if it's the same thing you said before. <laughs> it's just products that have kind of like uh, <laughs> concocted over the years by reading I don't know how many tens of thousands of studies anymore. Um, I probably go 
uh, through an average of about 50 a day. So if things, you know, something catches my fancy, I start experimenting with it. And then, you know, some of these things are well known. Uh, Ray has spoken about them at length. Uh, things like progesterone and the vitamins, like the, especially the fat solubles, um, the B vitamins, et cetera, et cetera. But some of the other ones are, you know, more uh, out there. Uh, not that there's no evidence for them. It's just that they're, they're more, um, what should I call it, fringe maybe. It's just they're entirely mine, mine invention, my concoction. They're not invention because it's based on ingredients that are already out there. But just the combination of the ingredients and the solvents and whatnot, it's, uh, it's entirely uh, coming out of me. Um, so it's a boutique cosmetic company because the license that we have only allows them to be sold as cosmetics, and that's how we advertise them. Um, so that's pretty much it. Yeah, whatever I uh, like when I read scientific studies, then I do a few experimentations myself on myself. Now that we have uh, access to labs that do animal studies, we do animal studies as well. And if something appears promising based on the evidence that's being published, uh, it's not toxic, and my own experiments confirm that it has promise. I, uh, you know, often release it as a product. Great stuff. Okay, so we'll be accepting uh, or taking calls again before we bail here. Um, maybe we can keep going on this vitamin D thing, just <laughs> just, just because, <laughs> you, just something to talk about. You really about. hit a nerve, huh? <laughs> well, I, I, again, I, I get the question so often. What about, okay, what about, we kind of talked about it, um, or you kind of talked about it with Ray, but what about the idea that, well, I, oh, okay, never mind, we got a call. Okay, so let me... That was fast. Okay, here we go. Okay, caller, can you hear us? Hey, how are you, caller? Hey. What, what's your name and I, where, where are you calling uh, from? Mike from New York. Hey, Mike, how are you, sir? All right, <laughs> hi, thanks again. Uh, cool, cool. This my friend has uh, he, he developed some neuropathy in his arms, in his hands and such, and he did. they did like, a, I guess, a CAT scan or some kind of scan, and they came up with a calcification of the basal ganglia. Uh, that's it. Do you have any uh, insight in this? Uh, Mike, I'm going to hang up on you, but thank you so much, okay? All right, fine. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, bye. bye. Okay, what do you think, George? I don't think it's only the calcification, but for the immediate problem, vitamin K has been shown to decalcify various parts of the brain, um, especially if taken at higher dosages for a period of a few months. Uh, but also, I think it, it would work better, and even though it sounds paradoxical, usually the soft tissue calcification happens when there's a deficiency of dietary calcium, elevated PTH, which means a deficiency usually of vitamin D, um, and also vitamin K. Now, the specific studies that I've seen showing decalcification, in other words, reversing it, not only preventing it, were only with vitamin K, but I would venture a guess that increasing dietary calcium and combining the D with the K, and they're very synergistic, uh, should be able to, should be, should be uh, accelerating or amplifying the decalcification process. Uh, second of all, I don't think the neuropathy is only due to the to the calcification of the basal ganglia. Usually, whenever there's a neuropathy, uh, estrogen is involved, um, and and progesterone has been shown in many cases to reverse uh, the neuropathy effects of estrogen. Uh, people with diabetes, especially type two diabetes, tend to have peripheral neuropathy, often severe to the point of them. Uh, losing control or feeling entirely in the extremities and uh, sometimes getting these extremities amputated because if the nerves over there die, uh, basically you're running a, the, the risk of, of, uh, of the, uh, that extremity becoming uh, gangrenous. And sometimes they have lesions as well which contribute to the gangrene. But usually if the, uh, if the innervation uh, disappears, then basically the body no longer has control over the tissue or organ and little by little, it becomes a threat to the organism. So long story short, progesterone and niacinamide in higher doses have been shown to reverse even very severe cases of peripheral neuropathy. So I don't think it will be a problem to uh, uh, maybe do some tests first. See, I, I suspect the person's estrogen will be high. If not on blood tests, then test the prolactin because that would really give you an idea. Uh, best to test both, like estrone, estrone sulfate, and estradiol plus the prolactin. Um, and in the PTH, the vitamin D, the serum calcium, um, you can test uh, total and ionized because sometimes they give different results. Uh, so it's good to test both. And the vitamin D, um, and then basically figure out if, if there's an issue with calcium as well, I suspect there is, uh, in, in terms of being deficient in the diet, which means the PTH will probably be high. Uh, so test the vitamin D. And, um, you know, uh, if, if any of these comes back this regular, especially the, the hormonal effect, the, the hormonal uh, profile, the estrogen being high, then I think 
taking uh, 50 to 100 milligrams of progesterone daily um, would probably not be that bad for a male. Some people say it gives the, it interferes with their sexual function, but every single male that has emailed me so far over the age of 30 has said that pro progesterone actually has greatly improved their libido. Um, and in, in some of the more elderly cases, such as people over 60 or even 70, has restored their ability to have, uh, pardon the TMI, morning wood, uh, <laughs> which is actually, actually is now medically confirmed as one of the most reliable predictors of total androgenic tone slash stores, especially in the elderly males. So morning erection is good is a good indication that the male is in good health. And progesterone, rather than interfering with that, seems to be promoting it, which means to me that either or could be both. Uh, we know it's we know it's it has an anti-estrogenic and anti-cortisol effect, but I suspect it's it can also serve in some people, especially elderly ones with lower androgen levels, progesterone can serve as a precursor uh, to the androgen because it is on that pathway. It, it was for a long time was thought that that male that humans synthesize androgens preferentially from pregnenolone, but given the all of these reports that I'm getting from progesterone, especially from elderly males, I suspect it can serve as a precursor, as a as a as, a, as an efficient precursor to androgens in males as well, in human males. Amazing. Okay, let's. Uh, we have another call here. Let me. Okay. <laughs> call it, caller. Can you hear us? Yes, we don't. Uh, okay, I guess they hung up. Okay, here's another one. I don't know. Oh, caller, you are on air. Uh, your name and where you're calling from. Yes, hi, Danny. Hi, uh, Georgie. This is Piotr. Uh, I've been emailing you from time to time. I'm from Philadelphia. Uh, I... Okay. Uh... I'm calling because uh, every time uh, I start to e reintroduce liver, like eating liver into my uh, diet, I get this uh, eczema on my fingers, like this hydrotic eczema from what I was able to find out on Google. And this this is very strange. And I, I when I stop eating liver for a couple months, I don't have any problems. I add liver to my diet, it comes back. It's like overload of vitamin uh, A or something, I don't really know. So I would appreciate some uh, information on this. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to hang up in, hang up on you right now. Thank you so much for the question. Okay. Okay. Thank take care. You, take care. Bye, brother. Okay. What do you think, Georgie? I would actually test iron. Um, I have actually have several clients report to me with uh, with similar issues and turn out their ferritin was really high. So if that's the case, I, I don't think liver is the is the, would be the, the appropriate thing here to eat because it's high in copper but also high in iron. So maybe maybe if the ferritin is high, aside from giving blood, maybe you know try to up the milk intake because it tends to chelate iron. Aspirin also chelates it, uh, and maybe switch to seafood to get the uh, the copper and the selenium, uh, and that, you know that tends to balance the extra iron inside inside the body. Um, the vitamin A tests in the blood are fairly reliable. Uh, so you should be able to do a, to do a blood test for vitamins, vitamin A and D. Probably not a bad idea to check uh, both of them because uh, they affect each other. Both of them protect from the side effects of each other. If it is a vitamin A toxicity issue, usually taking just a little bit of vitamin E tends to greatly reduce the propensity of vitamin A to to cause these uh, skin side effects. But my guess is that it's in, it's probably related to some kind of an iron issue, usually an excess. If the if the liver is exacerbating it, can I offer two uh, alternative hypotheses? So, the I think the liver can powerfully lower the blood sugar. Like the, the it, it's like very insulinogenic. I think and it's probably because of those amino acids. And so, if it was causing a low, like profoundly low blood sugar or something, that could exacerbate and maybe cause some type of uh, weird growth patterns in the skin. And the other thing is uh, to tag along on the the excess of vitamin A suppressing the thyroid function. And so if, if um, the caller was already borderline low thyroid and then they eat vitamin A and it suppresses their thyroid further, that might put them into a, a bad state. And so I think all those things are possibilities. And so the temperature and pulse and the other symptoms the person was experiencing would probably help uh, guide there. Um, yeah. Do you have any... Uh, uh, any other thoughts on that? 
No, I mean, the eczema is typically related to estrogen, but, uh, you know, if, the, if, the, if these tests have already been done and nothing has come back uh, alarming, uh, again, the est- estradiol, estrone, and prolactin will probably be, be the best to do. Um, so I will investigate the hormonal aspect, the vitamin A, which the blood test is pretty liable for, vitamin D, uh, and, uh, and the iron panel. So not just ferritin, but also uh, transferrin and iron saturation indexed. Uh, I, they usually they need to be done together in order to get a reliable picture of uh, basically what's the total iron store and capacity of the organism to carry and, and absorb it. Um, and um, those will be the four things that, that not necessarily in that order, but those will be the things that I would investigate. In any effect, uh, skin issues are, are typically, uh, not typically, they're always um, related to either lower metabolism and or intestinal irritation. Um, but the intestinal irritation, I, I guess that would be, uh, if it's only happening with the liver, that's probably not a likely cause because other, other foods would be causing it too. So if it's only the liver, then there's something in the liver causing it. And like I said, it's either the amino acids or the extra contents, which is high content of vitamin A. Uh, high and high content of iron. I don't see what else could be doing. <laughs> Thank you for that, Georgie. Thank you, caller. Uh, 161 people watching right now, 77 likes. So guys, hit the like button for Georgie. You know, do it for him. He appreciates it a lot. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll uh, cry if you don't. Yeah, it really it really helps us out. It, um, I appreciate it, guys. Okay, so let's do a few more calls here and then we'll wrap it up. And then we're going to have a break next week. I think I have like an interview on Friday. So I, I don't know if, uh, I don't really know if I'll record a Q&A though. I think there's a lot of that already exists. So we, we'll probably take a break next week, nothing. And then Ray will be on the 28th. So skip a week and then Ray Pete. And um, cool guys, you, I appreciate everybody's liking the episode now that uh, I know it's totally arbitrary and stupid, but when you take effort and make content, it helps a lot. So appreciate it. Okay, this person, uh, we're going to, okay. <laughs> Hello? Hey, how Hello? are you? You're on there. How are you? What's your name and where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Katya. I'm from Tennessee. And uh, like long time listener, I really appreciate you guys. <laughs> but my question is, so when I wake up in the morning, I usually drink water coffee sometimes i'll drink some orange juice and my hunger is like at a medium level but after i eat something i just become extremely hungry and uh do you know why this might be katya i'm gonna hang up on you thank you so much for your question thank you okay take care bye georgie what do you think i used to experience the exact same symptoms and that was at a time when my cortisol my morning cortisol was really really high so basically, what, when I was drink, drinking a little bit of orange juice, when I would walk, wake up in the morning, I would have almost no hunger because the cortisol would keep the blood sugar uh, abnormally high. But if I drink a little bit of orange juice or, or you know, a little bit of coffee or you eat a little bit, even a candy or like one egg, uh, basically within half an hour, I'll, I'll get this ravenous hunger. Um, and then later on, subsequently, I found through testing that basically it lowered my cortisol um, and, and basically that was allowing the natural hunger system to kick in. So usually related to high stress hormones in the morning, typically seen in night owls, which is, which is what I used to be as a former hardcore computer programmer. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, so I would, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, maybe try to go to bed early or, you know, um, you know, just, uh, eat a little bit of, uh, uh, milk before going to bed that tends to, because the casein in milk, uh, tends to keep you your digestive system active for longer and satiate it so it doesn't result in such a abnormal cortisol response in the morning. Uh, definitely don't go to bed on an empty stomach because that would drastically promote the cortisol response in the morning. Uh, in fact, uh, I know people who tested their, their morning, their blood sugar, the, va- the fasting blood sugar was above 120 because the doctor kept insisting on them not eating the night before um, and then showing up in the doctor's office in the morning for the annual physical. Um, and then uh, they were lean people, so the doctor was was just uh, completely confused, said, what's going on here? Why would your blood sugar be so high? And it just turned out it's because they've been, they, they, live, they live stressful lifestyles, and if you don't provide the nutrients, of course, the, the system goes into overdrive, the stress system goes into over, overdrive during darkness. So in the morning, you're especially vulnerable to all of these symptoms. But uh, that would be my explanation. Um, 
for females, progesterone would work should work really well if you're if you're opening Katya to uh, to try and progesterone. Um, aspirin also tends to work well because it's an inhibitor of the enzyme 11 beta HSD uh, type one, which is the one that creates the active cortisol from the inactive cortisone, and it works best actually if you take a little bit, maybe a tablet. But by tablet, I mean uh, the the full tablet, which is the 325 version, not the baby one, before going to bed. Not only protects you from the stress uh, during darkness, but also blunts, it has been proven in humans to blunt the morning cortisol response, which means you may wake up a little, uh, you know, feeling a little bit more sleepy, but you will not have this problem with eating a little bit or drinking a little bit and becoming ravenously hungry. Um, you should have a more normal onset of appetite. Um, and even even without any of these interventions, it's not a bad thing if you actually consume some extra calories in the morning because this is the meal that has been shown to have the lowest impact on weight gain. Uh, the later in the day you eat and the bigger the amount of calories you consume at night, especially in the form of fat, uh, the more of that you tend to store. So even if you're eating some extra calories in the morning, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. I'll be more concerned about restraining that stress response because if your cortisol is that high in the morning, chances are it's it's been almost that high throughout the night, which means you're not getting restful sleep uh, and many of the detox processes that are supposed to be happening in the brain, clearing out things like beta amyloid and all the other proteins uh, that are associated with some neurodegenerative diseases, all of these have been demonstrated to depend on deep restorative sleep. And cortisol is, together with serotonin, is probably the primary preventer of deep restorative sleep. Progesterone, by blocking cortisol and inhibiting some of the synthesis of serotonin, can, has been known to promote deep restorative sleep. It's also acting on the GABA system, right? Um, but if you don't want to dabble with the steroids, uh, aspirin seems to have pretty similar effects if, as long as you take at least a tablet. The baby aspirin won't do it. Yeah, and the w- one other comment on that is uh, drinking water in the morning. I know I'm going to sound like a nut, but if, if a person is very low thyroid, the water can exacerbate a low metabolic Dr- rate. Drastically. Yeah, r- like it can. Uh, I only say that because I have direct experience with it, and it used to make me feel like I had hypothermia when I would drink water. I'd get so cold, and I never had any reason why that would happen until I bumped into Ray's work and him talking about um, hypotonicity and hypertonicity and prolactin responding to hypotonicity and suppressing the thyroid function. So I know it sounds wacky, but drinking water when you're low thyroid is, is probably pretty risky. And so I'm not saying not to drink when you're thirsty, but just drinking excess water is probably not doing a person any favors. Okay. So we're going to take to, one. To this day, yep. it's it's still a, an un. Uh, not 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 unofficial, but a official test for seizure susceptibility mm-hmm. in hospitals. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you go to a hospital and they think you're like you have some kind of a seizure disorder, they may ask you to like to drink a quart of water without mm-hmm. any electrolytes in it. And typically, people which speaks to uh, brain neuroexcitotoxicity, and it's now known that estrogen is behind this mm-hmm. because aromatase inhibitor drugs have now been shown to be able to stop even treatment-resistant seizures that do not respond to anything else. So that that hypotonicity, not, it, it will not only lower, drastically lower your metabolism, it may trigger like a, like a very unpleasant reaction where you're st- starting to get startled by like uh, loud sounds mm-hmm. or like bright lights. Um, uh, like the, uh, I know people who are really, who had really low thyroid function and very high stress hormones in the morning, they get freaked out by traffic lights. The, like the, like it's, it's, they felt like they're about to get a seizure or at least they're like losing their mind when they're just staring at a red light, uh, sitting in their cars. So, uh, yeah. So another reason not to drink, if you drink water, uh, just try to drink it with some electrolytes. Drink coconut water instead of plain water from, from the tap or if you drink the, some mineral water may help. Um, the Gerolsteiner, which is my personal favorite, has a lot of is a very high mineral content, especially magnesium bicarbonate. But other mineral waters tend to have a sufficiently high electrolyte content to block some of the uh, some of the negative side effects of a large amount of water consumed on an empty stomach. Or you could just not drink any water at all. <laughs> That's I, mean, I presume she's being thirsty. That's why she's drinking it. I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that she's not drinking it for, just because she thinks she has to. Yeah, yeah. No, milk, orange juice, coffee, those all contain, and your food contains water too. Okay. Last call. This person has been calling in uh, frequently. Okay. So let me merge this. Uh, thank you to that last caller and all our callers, by the way. And you guys came through on the likes on this episode. Appreciate it a lot. Thank you guys so much. Okay. And merge call. 
Okay, caller, you are on there. Uh, your name and where you're calling from? Hello? Oh, hello. Yes, yes, how are you? Your name and where you're calling from? Hi, Danny. Hey. Hi, Georgie. How are you guys? It looks like hello. a kind of egg between us and the show, so I didn't know I was on. <laughs> well, you are. Do you have a question? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's about de novo lipogenesis. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask uh, if you guys knew of anything of the SCD1 um, protein, um, or uh, the enzyme, rather, and if people can store things rather than saturated uh, as unsaturated fat, if they were to consume, let's say, excess calories from carbs. Oh, is this Oz um, I, Ozan? Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't catch that. <laughs> good, good, to, good to chat with you. I reckon I didn't, I didn't catch that in the beginning. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Keep going. Oh yeah. So that was basically <laughs> my question. And people refer to this diet as like the, uh, the croissant diet talking about like increasing your, um, steric acid, uh, consumption. So I just wanted to know maybe if Georgie had any input, if it would be a good idea to eat like a lot more cacao butter or something, if somebody was to have this, um, enzyme problem, the SCD1, um, so that they store as saturated from excess calories instead of, um, it being unsaturated. Did you catch the whole question, Georgie? So, so the question is basically if you have a problem with a specific enzyme that's making you store saturated fat, uh, like what can you do to, to inhibit that protein? Uh, or, I mean, why would it be a problem if you store saturated fat? Most people tend to have the other problem. Like basically they're, when they're eating a mix of different fats, they will oxidize the saturated fat very quickly and they will store the PUFA, which will then get preferentially released when the person is under stress. Right. That was my understanding too. But, um, the, this enzyme called SCD1 apparently prevents people from storing as saturated fat and rather it becomes unsaturated. Um, I don't think you can, you can synthesize PUFAs from saturated fat. Uh, I think you can, the, uh, the steric acid can convert into oleic acid, uh, but that's about it. And I think palmitic can go to palmito lake, but all of these are mono unsaturated fats and they're not oh, that sure. dangerous. Okay. So you wouldn't say that that would be a, a big issue to try to inhibit. Uh, I don't think it's an issue. Uh, I, I wouldn't worry about eating saturated fat and that fat converting into a dangerous type of unsaturated fat. The most it can do is it, it can get converted to a mono unsaturated fats, um, and those tend to be at best neutral. Um, and then especially the palmito lake acid is actually has some benefits as well. The oleic acid is tends to be just relatively neutral. It doesn't cause much problems. Great. Thank you guys very much. Oh, oh Zan, when's that interview going to come out? <laughs> Next week. <laughs> awesome. I had a excellent conversation with Ozan, so I'm looking forward to uh, listening to that again. And um, Ozan is doing some great work. And in, in, Ozan has some of my most favorite interviews with Ray Pete. I, Ozan has calm energy, and, and they really go interesting places there. So how, how can they find those interviews, Ozan? Yeah, um, they're available on all the major uh, platforms like Spotify, iTunes, um, Stitcher, and you can also go to Red Circle, which is where I host my podcast from. That'll all be there or my website, primitiveinitiative.com. But yeah, I, I'm a little delayed in uh, releasing interviews, but thank you for your patience. And that should be available next week. No well, worries. One other thing for me, no, one other thing for me, consuming, so raising metabolic rate tends to inhibit the activity of the desaturase enzymes. If you're worried even about that minor desaturation of the fats. Um, and the same thing, uh, uh, polycosinol, the very long chain fatty acid alcohols can do that too. So if you're worried about the, the desaturation from, from saturated to monounsaturated, if you want to keep it fully saturated, raising the metabolic rate by any means possible or and or consuming polycosinol tends to uh, almost fully inhibit the activity of those enzymes. So whatever fat you store, if you ingest it as saturated, most of it that does not get metabolized should also get stored as saturated. That's great. And a shout out to you, Georgie, because I take your toco bit, which I think has polycoxanol in it. So uh, I think I'm covered there. I always feel great on that thing. <laughs> Any polycosinol, but you know, thank you for using Tokovid. Uh, wh whoever doesn't use it, if they want to buy polycosinol by the kilo and, and consume it like that, that should work as well. <laughs> Ozan, you're hey, the man. Thank you guys. so much, brother. Take care. Yeah, have a good night. Okay, talk to you soon. Bye, brother.
But. Okay, I think uh, I think we'll call it there. You know, we did almost two hours. Uh, we have an amazing listenership and a great chat. You know, uh, sincerely appreciate appreciate it, guys. Hanging out, hanging out with us on a Friday evening. Uh, thank you, Georgi Dinkov, my Bulgarian brother. Uh, you make this show always fun and worth doing. So thank you so much for that. So one more time. We will t- take a break this next week, and then we'll be back with Ray Pete. And so that should be very fun. And I think we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to actually extend that last conversation on nutrition, because I think I dropped the ball a little bit, and I, <laughs> I think we could have had a more broad overview. And instead of telling Ray what he has said, I think I would have, appro- well, I'll approach it a little differently this next time and ask him what he thinks rather than what he, what he said. Um, oh, you know what? I should read these donations. Um, Give me a second here. Let me pull up. What am I doing? Okay. <laughs> Why, uh, Georgie, uh, talk about something. <laughs> I actually plan on asking Ray uh, in relation to this whole prepping thing, if, you know, things re- do really collapse, uh, about ways to improve like the, 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 the quality of things like eggs, the milk and whatnot. Because there, if you look at the literature published, the, uh, there's some really interesting old studies. I think I kind of mentioned a few times too that if you feed chickens like things like butter, uh, extra salt, uh, pregnenolone, some steroids, polycosinol, whatnot, like it really changes not only the like the the consistency, the the quality of the eggs, but also the effects those eggs have on other organisms. There's some older studies showing that if you if you uh, give chickens polycosinol First of all, they start laying eggs like crazy. So you're going to be increasing the output. You can probably feed like, I don't know, 20 people with two chickens. <laughs> but also the, the eggs were really different in terms of quality. And when those eggs were fed to rats, it drastically improved their fertility. So there must be something going on. So, you know, maybe we can talk to Ray about like, what can we do to improve like the quality of the food that we are producing ourselves? What, what would be, what would a person on a farm do ideally? Um, you know, Livestock breeding is not an easy task. Um, so if you have to be limited to like, I don't know, uh, a few goats and a few chickens and maybe a garden, what would be the best thing to cultivate with, with, with these limited means? YouTube does not make it easy for me to f- find these super chats. Okay. So the thing I want to say about the next right episode is it's going to be uh, like kind of catch up with certain random topics. Like we'll talk about nutrition more. We'll talk about whatever Georgie wants to talk about. And then we're going to do Q and a. And so, um, maybe we'll do the, since this is working, I don't think, I don't know if Skype can do a four way call. And so maybe, maybe we'll be inhibited by technical problems, but, um, we'll definitely do a Like I'm going to accept questions and we'll read them to Ray. And so I'll be soliciting questions on telegram and Twitter and Facebook and all those places. Okay. So let me read these uh, names for these very generous people. So Janet, Pack, thank you so much. Space 99 Yak, thank you so much. Michael, thank you so much. Gene Pack, uh, Booster Biology, I, aka Lucas, I think. Thank you so much. Kana, thank you so much. Kana, uh, Peggy, thank you so much. Peggy, uh, Linda, Omar, uh, Space 99 Yak again, Janet Pack, or, 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 or again, all these people frequently contribute to the show. So thank you guys so much. It means a lot and it really does help. So thank you guys um, so much. Okay. And with that, Georgie, your. Parting words. <laughs> I don't know. I, I I think we're gonna see a, a a huge development this year. I don't know what else, but I think the powers that be are quickly running out of ammo. The COVID nineteen narrative is kind of collapsing. Uh, I just saw an article. Actually, one of my one of the listeners on your show sent me an article showing that uh, two thirds of of the population of Eastern European countries, Bulgaria specifically, is absolutely refusing to get vaccinated. Um, half half of the people in France, um, and it, probably I would say at least half the people in Europe are refusing hardcore to get vaccinated. So I just don't know how the whole narrative will continue if a significant portion of the people would not take the jab. I think that's a core milestone, so to speak, in the Great Reset agenda. And if that's failing, then we may see some either uh, either another kind of calamity, uh, uh, you know, fake or real. And I just don't think the system will continue to survive for much longer. There just isn't much going on. Uh, another article came out recently saying that people are now not coming back into the workforce. Um, basically, they're quitting in mass. They're deciding it's not worth it. It's just basically a you know a, a slave job 
They will never be able to to have the life that their parents had. So they're searching for alternatives, and all of these alternatives seem to be outside of the system. And that system depends on slaves. And if people have already qu- are quit in mass and are not coming back, then uh, there there aren't that many options remaining for the system. And they're not taking the job. So if they were planning on exterminating, you know, most of the population and half the population saying, nope, I'm not going to take it. System doesn't have many other options uh, other than a full-scale war or just, uh, I don't know, quietly withering away. Let's hope it's the second. Did you see on the Ray Pete email depository <laughs> that somebody posted a, a 2020 email from Ray saying that he thought the, the vaccine would depopulate uh, by 80 to 90%? Did you catch that? <laughs> Ray thought that he would depopulate? Yes. Ray had an wow. email in, the, in 2020, and he said 80 to 90%. Well, so again, I don't want to say that's what he thinks. We just discussed that if not, if well, even if it doesn't kill those, if it does trigger infertility in the entire generation, as we just discussed, mm-hmm. then that's enough because if these people don't procreate, then in, within a generation, we would be down probably eighty to ninety percent in terms of numbers. I've been really wrong because I I would analyze his answers and think that he didn't think that the the vaccine was for depopulation. But um, and again, I don't want to put words in his mouth. You know, he can he can say right now what he thinks, but. Um, Apparently in 2020, that's what he thought. And you can check that out on the repeat email depository. Okay. P- uh, Did he meant it only for the mRNA vaccines or just any of those vaccines that have been promoted right now? I can send you, uh, you can check out the, I can send you it after okay, the show. Yeah, I'll find I, it. Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah. I think he specifically meant the R, the mRNA vaccines. Um, P order, uh, P I O T R. Thank you so much for your, uh, super chat. Sincerely appreciate that. And okay. One last time skipping next week, nothing, uh, on next Friday, but the Friday after will be repeat. And then I'll grab a bunch of questions from you guys about um, just just whatever that you want us to chat uh, with uh, with about with Ray Pete. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you to our listenership. The chat is awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to all future listeners. How of many this people? Show. Are we? We had like a hundred hundred and sixty viewers at the the same time, and so. Again, beyond uh, beyond pleased with just uh, how this show is growing, and again, t- all thanks to Georgie for repeatedly meeting me here, you know, and, and doing these together. I, I will see you in the gulag. The yeah, way yeah. That these <laughs> <are going. laughs> exactly, exactly. Thank you, Georgie Dinkov. Thank you, Chat. Thank you, our amazing listenership on all the platforms. We have a huge listenership on Spotify and things. So, thank you guys so much, and uh, we'll catch you not this next week, but the week after. Okay, peace out, everybody. Take care. Bye.